Greetings, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to our Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations program. Today, we learn about a surprising brain adaptation, normal language acquisition, despite the absence of the necessary associated brain region. Our guest is Evelina Fedorenko, Associate Professor of Neuroscience at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and investigator at the McGovern Institute uh, for Brain Research. Dr. Fedorenko specializes in unique cases of language acquisition, and she's here to explain what these cases reveal about the human brain, which happens to be the most complex structure that we know of. Dr. Federenko, thank you very much for joining us and My welcome, pleasure. very big welcome. Thank you very much. Now, you do something really unique and I'm delighted that we get to talk about it today. First of all, this is uh, called the Interesting Brain Project and it certainly is that. Could you give us a little idea of what that is? Of course. So um, my lab in general studies um, the human language system, trying to understand which mechanisms allow us to understand and produce language. And um, in the last few years, we got interested in brains that are not like you're in my brain. Well, I don't know, you've never oh, been scanned, God. have you? <laughs> uh, unlike brains of most individuals. And these are um, individuals who, for some reason, have an atypical brain. The atypicality could come from some congenital condition, um, early stroke, cysts. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we look also at cases of surgical resections, but mostly we focus on these cases of organic damage. So early strokes, cysts, sometimes cases of extreme hydrocephalus, where there is an overproduction of the cerebrospinal fluid and it kind of yes. squashes the brain to the yes. edges, to Ooh, the skull. Yes. And so the reason that we got interested in these brains is that they provide this really interesting window on the constraints that are hard versus soft in how brain can function, providing yeah. real um, typical light cognition. Um, in many of these cases, these individuals didn't know that their brain was atypical until quite late in life, uh, where sometimes they go for some routine yeah, check, like, yeah, they, like the neck yeah. pain or yeah, something, yeah. right, or something else, and uh, they find out that their brains are really um, quite different from right. uh, other right. brains. And um, in most of those cases, that damage or the cyst or whatever has been with them for quite some time. Right. Uh, and I think that we can learn um, some, something about the structure and function of the brain that we just can't learn from typical right. brains. Right. You very kindly did a program with us uh, once before, a few years ago, about uh, people who are called polyglots, but hyper polyglots. Right. They are able to learn many languages mm -hmm. at a speed and level that most of us That's cannot right. master. That's, right. That's second language acquisition for the most part. Mm -hmm. But in this case that we're going to talk about today, it is the first language, That's your, your right. initial language. And one more thing about that project, you have a, an emphasis on single case studies. And I don't That's know right. if this is familiar to the general public, mm -hmm. but today everything is lots of data, a That's whole bunch right. of subjects. That's right. And you have very yeah. much focused on this why. That's right. So um, there is this contrast that is now being drawn between big data and deep data. And oftentimes um, certain questions require collecting data that um, uh, come from a single individual, but there's a lot of it. So for example, you test many different kinds of contrasts, or you have a brain that you simply can't find many of, and then um, you don't want to lose that opportunity. And so our whole approach is based on identifying relevant functional regions using tools like fMRI at the individual brain level. Mm -hmm. So I can bring you to MIT, I can scan you in our test, and I can mm -hmm. say, here is, Yvonne, where your language regions are. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna be broadly similar to another individual, mm -hmm. but their exact locations are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And if you don't take that variability into account and you just average a bunch of brains together, you get this very blurry picture. 
And so for a long time, we've been kind of perfecting these tools, being able to perform relevant contrasts within individuals. And so then an opportunity presented to study one individual with this very atypical brain. And we, of course, jumped at this opportunity because we already had the tools in place to um, basically look at how her language system looks, how her general reasoning system looks, how her social cognition system looks, right. and so on. And that case is our topic today. This is really extraordinary. Could you uh, tell us, like, what do you need generally to learn uh, what, when you acquire language? And I'd like to point out if, uh, that language is, is really quite unique with humans and their uh, arguments made that the birds and the bees and everything else is, have language too, but would you agree it's not quite the same as I language? Think it's, I think it's hard to answer that question because there's a lot we don't understand about animal communication. True. And in fact, there's beautiful cases now where things that sounded like grunts in certain species of monkeys turn out to carry inc incredibly complex information. So I don't, I'm not out there to oh, okay. make human uniqueness claims, but okay. we do have a really cool communication system, right? We can take any complex abstract thought and turn it into a sequence of right. words. It's very close to, uh, it's like the closest we've come to telepathy, right? Except yeah. we do need to actually overtly say it, but right. you know, we can share the contents of each other's minds and that's really great. And so um, there's very little that we understand about how the brain system emerges. Okay. So that's what you're asking about development, right? Right, right. And the reason for that is that um, uh, we can scan uh, in functional MRI infants up to about six or seven months old. Typically, it's done with sleeping infants, and you just play them sounds like speech sounds or music, and you see how their brains respond. The information is still going through. And then you can scan kids from about the age of four or so. But there's this black window in between where we know a lot behaviorally what happens. And if anybody had a kid, they yeah, know right. that typically in that window, there's this explosion that yes, happens yes, where initially yes, there's a few yes. words and suddenly there's a lot of words and phrases right. and sentences. And we can't figure out how to probe kids of um, brains of kids who are at that sweet spot, like one and a half, two years of Very age. Very interesting. We're not working on this, but we're in using this interesting brains project as a potential window on how this might happen yeah. by looking at these atypicalities and trying to figure out constraints on um, things that could work yeah. okay given different brains and things that maybe cause problems. Okay, so we need a human brain, but then there are regions of the brain That's and right. the two hemispheres and so on. And this, this particular case, what happened? What was what was what was wrong there? Yes. And then you bring up a, the image so you can That's see right. too. That's right. Yeah. So this individual, um, we refer to her as E.G. Um, she she asked to to do that, um, and um, she has uh, pretty much um, her whole temporal lobe is missing. This is actually a few different brains that you yes. see here, yeah. and her brain is in the upper right corner. Yes. So. Um, Basically, at some point, she went in for uh, a routine MRI and discovered that um, she is missing this big chunk of the brain. This is this substantial. This is in the left side. This where is we left usually typically side, exactly, kind language. of around okay. the ear. Yeah. There's this big hunk of the brain that kind of hangs a little bit. You can, if you hold a human brain in your hand, it kind of separates out. It's a big, big chunk. And so, um, when the doctor saw her brain. They were really surprised. They told her a lot of <laughs> offensive stuff, like you shouldn't be walking, you shouldn't be talking, which tells you something about um, training of doctors in uh, parts of the country. But anyway, um, she um, she's totally fine. She's a very successful individual. Uh, she's never had any cognitive issues. And um, so at some point, she got in touch and she said, I am missing my left temporal lobe. Would you like to scan me? <laughs> and we said, yes, we would. Um, we have tools, just um, the right kind of tools to scan uh, and make inferences about individuals. And so um, we wanted to um, look at a couple of things uh, with uh, EG's brain. So one is that we wanted to kind of see if the common wisdom, and so given that she was fine, this um, loss of left temporal lobe likely occurred very early in life, likely yeah, due so to early stroke. So she was stroke. born without? Uh, uh, okay. She either was born without it or it happened in the first you know, a few yes, weeks right. of life yes, or something yes, like see. that. So very shortly after birth, such that at the time that you're an infant, you wouldn't show any symptoms yet, right? Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. you don't do much as an infant. Right. So unless you're a little bit older, <laughs> exactly, uh, unless you kind of, you know, start 
having some really gross issues, um, you usually don't may not 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 know to such events. And so um, we wanted to see. So there's this common wisdom that extensive early left hemisphere damage will lead your language system, which is typically in the left hemisphere, to remap onto the right hemisphere. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, one story goes that the language system actually starts out as a bilateral system, so in both uh. hemispheres, and eventually the right hemisphere kind of subsides and the left hemisphere becomes dominant. And so uh, first we wanted to see if indeed in this individual you would see a right um, uh, lateralized language system, and you do. She has a beautiful, typical looking uh, language system in her right hemisphere and verbally she's great she's actually in the higher end yeah. of like if you use standard assessments kind of like SAT like yeah. test she scores very highly very high vocabulary very fast um, even if you kind of push the system she's like no problems um, but the question another question that we were really interested um, uh, in is whether she would show any response to language in her left frontal yes, lobe, yes. right? So typically your language system kind of spans some parts of the left frontal lobe and some parts of the left temporal lobe. And there are strong connections mm -hmm, between mm -hmm, those mm -hmm. components and so on. And her left frontal lobe is great. It's perfectly mm -hmm, functional. Mm -hmm. Everything's there. It responds to other things. Mm -hmm. and, but she didn't have that left temporal lobe from early on in life. And the question is, do you need this left component, temporal component, and the connections to the frontal lobe yes, to right, wire up right. the left frontal cortex for language? And she basically shows no response at all to language in her left frontal lobe. It's all in the right. It's a very lateralized Isn't system. Isn't that something? Yes. <laughs> we, we thought that was very cool um, because there, it seems like there's no reason not to use it. But it turns out, apparently, you can't wire up that components through the between hemisphere yeah, uh, connections. Right, you right. need these within, early on, yeah, exactly, very early on. Exactly. Right. So if yeah. you would lose language mm -hmm. later, that doesn't it does not recover. Yeah, that's uh, right. From that's there. right. Mm -hmm. So and, uh, we'll see if we can cover that a little bit. But yeah. Again, so mm -hmm. this the, the the issue I guess is the unique plasticity at the earliest ages that the uh, right hemisphere could take over. That's right. For their, but that's interesting you brought up. There is a component already in the right hemisphere. That's new. It's a so claim. Yeah, yes, I understand. It's a claim. I'm not sure if that's quite right. Okay. So it is certainly the case that you can grow a language system on the right hemisphere right. and you can grow up with language function perfectly intact. Right, right. But actually, if you look at the developmental literature, the story about the fully bilateral language system doesn't yes, quite bear right. out. Okay, okay. <laughs> in fact, by age, um, I mean, we've seen it in our data by age four or five. Some groups have now reported this earlier. You see a left hemisphere bias. Yes. But, and we are trying to understand what that bias in the presence of the ability of the right hemisphere to take over, what it means. Yes. So it does seem like there's still that early bias towards the left hemisphere, but somehow the right hemisphere remains if flexible it has enough. To. Exactly. If it, has it can to. do the job. Right. That's right, right. Right. So, mm -hmm. but it's quite interesting that this could be so phenomenal, and yeah. she could learn language so very well. She that's was right. Really. In uh, fact, she was highly proficient in a foreign language. Yes, and that's something. Russian, actually, um, which is an unusual well, that's, language. That's to a learn. hard one. Right. <laughs> it's pretty yes. hard, and she's like she's. Fluent, like she used to, um, yeah, she used to like read novels in Russian. And so she's she's really quite remarkable. It's, yes. You would never say anything's wrong with her brain. May I ask, uh -huh. did she acquire that particular second language later, Late. like in, in, a, like in, in school. adolescence yeah. and so on? But yeah. still, she was highly proficient. Yeah. yeah. Because, yeah. well, yes, uh, that there's usually a difficulty That's acquiring right. the syntax or That's acquiring right. the right. accent or something That's like right. that. That's right. That's right. But That's she right. was great. I mean, as we talked about, I think, last time a little bit, there's also a lot of variability. Like, some people yes, are right. much better than yes. others, and maybe she's, like, linguistically gifted a little exactly. bit, you know, and so and she could do that. Exactly, that left That's right. anyway, right, right, <laughs> exactly. right. Exactly, yeah. Could you tell us something about this critical period, just for background, mm -hmm. uh, critical period for language acquisition, yep. the first language, first mm -hmm. language acquisition? Yeah, so, so the... Um, the claim, one claim, is that there is some point in the teenage years after which it becomes more difficult to learn a language. The claim is made in general about learning language, but of course most evidence comes from the greater difficulty of learning foreign languages later in life, because there's not many cases where kids grow up without a language. Um, 
And so uh, that um, the evidence for that claim is it's not perfect. There is a, f a, f a few studies that have suggested one very large scale study from uh, George Hartshorn, who is actually at uh, Boston College here locally, from like half a million people, but using a very short test. So, so there, it's not. It's not like everybody has a perfect, right, decisive right, way to right, do it, right. and it's most likely not like a sharp point in time that's the same for everyone, but it does seem like after a certain point in life, it becomes more difficult to learn a second language. Now, remember that it's also a very bad experiment to compare a kid learning a language and an adolescent learning a foreign language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The situations are very, very different, right? Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. as a kid, you have your caretakers around you, and whenever you're awake, somebody's talking to you at your face, playing with you. Like, there is a lot, a lot of language. It's input. not in a textbook. It's Exactly. Not it's not textbook. in a textbook, and it's, like, important for your survival. This is, yes, yes, <laughs> like yes. Like, later, it's like these classes you take, or even immersion programs. I mean, it's, it, it's just not this... The, it's a very, very hard comparison to make. So why exactly it becomes difficult has been difficult to pinpoint. Right. I wanted to bring that up because the, we're a nation of immigrants. And so people Indeed. come at different ages. Yeah. And one of the famous cases, now the, the, you end up like, say, you never master the syntax, the, the grammar of the yeah. language. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. Or you might not master the uh, phonology of, right. of, right. of the language. Yeah. So you'd end up with an accent. Uh, mm -hmm. an accent. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually I, the, 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 the thing has been like after maybe age 10. Mm -hmm. But as you say, it would vary with yep. individuals. Yep. But a famous case was Henry Kissinger, who was Secretary of State for a long time, just yeah. turned 100. Uh -huh. But uh, he um, came at like age nine mm -hmm. and kept the German accent <laughs> all his life. But his syntax was, I mean, his grammar was, was perfect. perfect. Yeah. But he tried hard. So to it wasn't overcome. by choice to it preserve was not like by identity. Choice. <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, that's an inter, it's mm -hmm. one of many. It just happened yeah, to be a yeah, famous, yeah. a famous person. That's right. But so there, there's something about this, the plasticity of the brain yeah. for certain things. Music is another. You, some instruments Allegedly, you need to learn yeah, early, yeah, 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 and yeah, probably right. some things uh, that are very involved with. Um, uh, physically, exactly, uh, like ballet. You try ballet, to do that after ballet, all. <laughs> right? Exactly. You have to start right. early in life with some yeah. of those things. Yeah. I was going to say I don't know about baseball and stuff. Yeah, I'm out of I my don't. depth there with that. Yeah, but help you there. in any case, so uh, people can adapt, uh, and people vary in this regard. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's this fabulous case, and uh, uh, that you have mentioned, and mm -hmm. this woman was very adept at language. Yep. Period. That's right. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, didn't know she was missing anything That's even right. until. That's right. Do you know if this is very, very, very uncommon to miss a piece of the brain? <laughs> <laughs> so the prevalence is actually really hard to assess because as of right now, it's not the case that everybody gets a routine MRI. That's what's going to say. <laughs> now, in some countries, that's changing, right? So there is oh. this huge project in the UK, the UK Biobank, that has massive, massive numbers of people who have participated. I think in Iceland or maybe somewhere else in Scandinavia, they're trying to like do scan everyone and then we'll be able to estimate things like the prevalence of these kinds of How cases. How very interesting. <laughs> so that would be useful You're waiting to know. for that, right. Yeah. <laughs> but without that, all we know is that if you mention something about atypical brains, suddenly a lot of people pop up and they write to you. And they're, you're ready. Exactly. You're ready and they say, that. hey, I found out I'm missing a chunk of my cerebellum or I'm missing yes. my frontal cortex. Or, yes. You know, for some other, or I have like severe hydrocephalus, never had any problems, but it's all squashed in there, you know? Yeah, right. And um, that's what happened when uh, our work got covered in uh, Wired, uh, Wired magazine. Um, I suddenly had my inbox flooding Aha, with cool brain are. images. <laughs> and that was really great. Yes. It's actually, um, so far we actually haven't even done like systematic recruitment, which we're hoping to start doing soon, especially um, we have, I have a new postdoc, Haley Olson, who is going to do a pediatric component. Now we're going to try to find kids. So these are not going to be asymptomatic, fully asymptomatic cases, right. because um, if a kid is being scanned, then there are some issues. Yes. But I think we still can learn uh, a lot by scanning these kids as they're developing, as they're developing their language abilities, as they're learning um, 
you know, to reason about the world and so on. So um, we'll start to hopefully recruit more systematically, but so far it's been all kind of bottom up people writing to us and then we basically figure out which cases are kind of most informative to the kinds of things we're trying to do and then bring yes. them out. Mm -hmm. Which kinds of cases would be most informative? Now, surely this yeah. one would be the spectacular. That's right. You focus on language, <laughs> and right. then you have these cases. Have you been? Uh, have you seen some interesting cases or hear, heard have. about it? You're not. Yeah. So there's a couple of interesting things that we're focusing on right now. So we're mostly so far focusing on uh, left hemisphere damage, just yeah. because of you know kind of the main focus on language <laughs> exactly. But there is um, two things that we're trying to um, look at right now. So so one is um, the relationship between language and other functions. So I've long been interested in where language comes from, how it relates to our general smarts mm -hmm. versus to our mm -hmm. social mm -hmm. capacities. Mm -hmm. There's all these evolutionary sto stories that people tell, but they're very hard to test, of course. And one kind of inference I think you can maybe make is by looking at brains that have less tissue to work with. Mm. So for example, if um, you suddenly have a lot less brain tissue to work with, do you start seeing uh, more overlap between language and other things? And if so, is there something systematic about which things language is more likely to overlap with? Because if I scan you or if I scan myself, the language system is very sharply dissociated mm -hmm. from both the social mm -hmm. system and the kind of general reasoning system. Um, but we see that in some individuals, especially in these cases where the language system moves to the right, and typically the right hemisphere supports social functions, we start seeing some overlap overlap in parts of the um, right hemisphere, suggesting that language may be, in terms of its underlying computations, may be more similar to kind of social mm -hmm. perception and or cognition. And we've never seen language overlap with general reasoning, suggesting that those are just really very different beasts. Very so, interesting. But it's so. hard to imagine reasoning without language. Uh, ah. you, know, but, uh, oh, you, you think otherwise. Okay. All I right. think You're, otherwise. I've been fighting okay. that battle for very a while. Interesting. Language seems very different from reasoning. We have intuitions sometimes that we use language to reason, like mm -hmm. introspectively it feels like it, but actually you can take individuals with really severe language problems, like severe aphasia. They can't name anything, they can't understand anything, Wow! and they can do math, they can play chess. Yes, right. yes. They can do yes. All yes. Stuff. yes, So yes. Yes. in spite of our intuitions, language and kind of I, general I symbolic reasoning. Uh, you, yeah. you have like some basic language, but n not being yeah. overly verbal or something like yeah. that is, is what you mean. Mm -hmm. But there's so much interest in things like aphasia uh, at yeah. this point. You're right on it. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have some cases like that coming up? Uh, well, just... um, so for aphasia, I mean, we have a big uh, collaborate. Well, actually, we've collaborated with two groups. Uh, one is Ro Rosemary Varley's group at, in the UK, and she's focused exactly on the cases I just mentioned, individuals with severe, severe language problems. So pretty much yeah. the language system is gone. It's like a is massive, this... massive stroke. Right. No, this so... is, they never develop language. Is that it? No, no, no. Those are individuals it. who grow up. They're fine, yes. and then they lose it. It's also, it's that's like, right. that's just like that's stroke right. or something exactly. like that. Exactly, exactly. Oh, okay, but they generation. did have language that's right. earlier. Yeah. Right, I understand. Okay, yeah, it's very, understand. there's hardly any cases of growing up without language, right? Like yes. we have little bits of evidence from deaf kids born to hearing parents, yes. which yeah. um, I think we'll maybe talk briefly about last time. And um, some aspects of reasoning, especially social reasoning, yes. do appear to be delayed, but a lot of reasoning is also okay, like developed. Fine. It's not like you can't fundamentally reason about abstract, complex things and make causal connections if right. you don't have right. linguistic. Reasons. May I ask, just uh, mm -hmm. by the by, the the there are many children who uh, are you might say deprived. It's a kind of social thing. People don't communicate with them or something like that. So they go to school yeah. and their language proficiency is not normal, but they can yeah. catch up? It's That's a very touchy issue. I mean, uh, I think there is a lot of, um, a lot of blame that's been put on parents sometimes in lower socioeconomic um, 
uh, situations where in environments where, for example, the parent has to work, like a single mom has to work three right, jobs, right. and then she's also getting blamed for not reading to uh, her yeah, kid I enough or something. That, right, but it actually turns out that most of that early input doesn't really matter that okay, much. That's, that's Kids what will like. be just fine. And in fact, there's cultures, like for example, in some parts of the Amazon, where adults don't talk to children well, at I, I all was for a while. Say, historically, they're like, they don't understand. Right. <laughs> well, his, his story, but they're around yeah, language. That's right. That's but right. People, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in our cultures today, a lot of the modern cultures, people are uh, well, more urban. People yeah. spend a lot of time with their kids and That's so on. Right. And then there's probably a payoff with that. Yeah. But uh, historically, it seems like it's people had larger case. families. Everybody's too busy. Yeah. And the children just sort of get through, you know, yeah. with it. And hard to tell. I think also there's people so, who like right. walk, like start to walk slowly. Yeah, right, right. They They're, grow up and they're not like worse walkers. Okay, <laughs> good. Grow. Good to hear that. Good to hear that. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, so but that is uh, that's very interesting that that's the case now. Mm -hmm. There's any relationship between late second language acquisition? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know what I mean yeah. as a teenager yeah, and so yeah. on. So there's a sort of you can acquire other languages mm -hmm. very easily mm -hmm. if you are say up to age nine, that's whatever right. it is, and that's it varies. Right. And in Europe and other parts of the world where people you often grow up you, multilingual, yeah, you grow up with right. multiple languages yeah. anyway. Mm -hmm. That works, and in the, here and in many other places, that yeah. the people have to go to school and learn that's a second right. language. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you tell us anything about that kind of? maturation process in the brain where it says, okay, I'm not going to do that the same way. I'm not acquiring no. language in the same way. Do you know anything? I mean, there is, again, there's a bunch of um, hypotheses yeah. of what happens, right? Like one thing is the brain fills up with information, right? We keep learning about the world across all the time. So there's just a lot less kind of yeah. uh, tissue up for grabs. But from what we and other groups have seen, the second language ends up in the very same parts of the brain. It's in yeah. the same system. So it's not like you're using a fundamentally different um, brain mechanism to represent and right, process right. that second language. But something about learning uh, could, could be different. Like I said, it's also a very bad experiment. So many things are different. But um, there is um, uh, some work that, for example, has argued that inability to divide the speech stream or the sign stream, if you're talking about sign language, into words is actually helpful because yeah. kids get stuff as chunks. There's yeah, no yes, pauses yeah, between yeah. words in right, speech. Right. And oftentimes, if you get a whole chunk, that can kind of help you later figure out how words relate to each yeah. other. Whereas once you grow up and you learn literacy typically, right, right, right in societies yes, where yes, we're talking yes. about, then you have this attempt to like learn everything word by word and assemble things in a word by word um, way, as opposed to kind of learning a whole chunk yes. and knowing what context that occurs in. And so that's quite different from just experientially how we learn those languages. But what exactly it is, I don't think anybody has a conclusive okay. answer yet. <laughs> All right. We have just a couple of minutes mm -hmm. left, and I'm interested in if you can explain it for us, how you do the actual experiment. So we know it's mm -hmm. fMRI yeah. and you're very careful and it's single yeah. case and so on. So in the case of this woman mm -hmm. uh, with the extraordinary yeah. uh, language uh, mm -hmm. prop issue thing, yeah. but, but, but uh, uh, how do you go about studying that? If so, I come to mm -hmm. you with a missing yeah. left temporal. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So we basically use the same paradigms that we've been using on more typical brains, which is, um, uh, we call them localizer paradigms yes. because we use them to localize different functions. And we have them for a few different aspects of perception, motor control, cognition, and one of them is language. The way you find language in the brain is you basically have people listen to or read some sentences or short stories. It doesn't matter if you're listening or reading. Yes. By the time the information gets to the system we're trying to find, it doesn't matter where it came from. And then as a control condition, you have people sa listen to something like non-word speech. So things that sound like floor, blicket, you know, things that sound yeah, language-like right, right, but right. aren't interpretable. And that just a five minute scan of doing listening to these different things will get you your beautiful language Isn't system. Isn't that outline. interesting? And that uh, that is that's especially interesting. Single case it really right. sort of underscores just, the yep. beauty of that, doesn't it? Yeah. Very interesting, Very nice, yeah. uh, Dr. Federenko. I really appreciate all this information. I hope that 
you will uh, really expand this interesting brain project, <laughs> and it's Working a real it. contribution. It really will make a marked contribution, I'm we sure, to this so. science. Yeah. But in any case, thank you ever so much for this very interesting chat. Thank, thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much. <laughs>